These attributes were common not just to the ancient mythologies, they were also common to Jesus. That's a dangerous admission from a Christian apologist. While all the gods of antiquity shared some of the same expectations of deity, only Jesus personified and embodied every expectation. Just as modern filmmaking is informed by the accumulated expectations set by 120 years of movies of the past, tropes and best practices emerge from positive audience engagement. Was there any evidence that God might have been preparing humanity for the arrival of Jesus? Jesus seems similar to all the ancient mythologies before him, Therefore, God was directing the pens of ancient poets to write imperfectly about Jesus? I think Detective Wallace is putting the metaphorical chariot of Apollo before the Trojan horse. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And today, we're looking at retired cold case detective turned professional Christian apologist, J. Warner Wallace. You may recall discussion here of his most recent book, Person of Interest, where he argues truth of the gospel from the popularity of derivative works. And I spent a month putting together a copy of Star Wars A New Hope purely from derivative works. These are not the droids you're looking for. Move along. Move along. How'd you make him do that? Force can sometimes have great power on the weak-minded. And that sparked a whole back and forth thing. Anyhow, for the non-reading crowd, The Good Detective has created a video study for a person of interest on... DVD? Apparently that's still a thing in the evangelical world. And I thought I'd get someone in to help me with Wallace's case from ancient mythology. Dr. Dennis McDonald. Paul, it's a pleasure to be with you and to take on some misinformation that is out there about the Christian texts that we're going to be looking at. I'm a retired biblical scholar. I'm probably known best for a methodology called mimesis criticism. That's the use of imitation of classical Greek poetry in particular in the composition of the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. But I've also spent a lot of time with Christian Apocrypha, where one finds also such imitation. And I'm also a scholar of the Q document. I've published 15 volumes, including the synopses of Epic Tragedy and the Gospels, which is available for not very much money through Amazon. And now I'm with you. So I look very much forward to the talking with you and getting your own wisdom. Don't get your hopes up for wisdom from me. Mostly I'm a student, like your recent course. We're reading the Gospels with one eye on Greek poetry. And we'll get into all the details on how the audience can learn from that later in the video. But reading the Gospels with one eye on Greek poetry is perfect for this video today. Are you familiar with Jay Warner Wallace at all? Only because you've made me familiar with him modestly. So I really don't know. Fair enough. When I first started to read the Bible, I considered it more like mythology than history, and not even original mythology at that. Obviously, he is appealing to the visual here. He has a bust of what looks like a Roman character on the right-hand side, a tidy bookshelves behind him, a clean desk, and it looks like he's holding a Bible so that it looks like a pastor's study. There's Solomon's head of Christ over his right shoulder, and there's a globe indicating something of a global orientation, and it looks like he has a detective whiteboard on to the right side with pictures. So it really is quite a visual pleasure. I often call that photo the, uh, the Jesus grad photo. Good job. Take, for example, when Jesus turned water into wine at Cana. This story seemed... Awfully familiar. Didn't Dionysus of Greek mythology do something similar hundreds of years earlier? It looked to me as if the Bible borrowed this myth from the Greeks. Of course Dionysus did it, and even ancient Christians recognized the similarity between the Dionysus turning water into wine and Jesus doing so in the Gospel of John. Yes, at least at that point, he got the message. What's curious is in the rest of his presentation, he doesn't try to say anything about, let's say, Euripides, Bacchae, or other texts about Dionysus. So I wouldn't come back to Dionysus later. One thing appears certain. For much of history, 
Humans have nearly universally believed in gods of one kind or another, inserting these gods into their myths and folklores. At first glance, many of these gods seem similar to one another. Many share similar backgrounds, similar teaching, and even similar life events. Some even share characteristics with Jesus. Why would this be the case? In the section that follows, he gives his own taxonomy of how the ancient mythic structures work. He gives a list of about 13 different mythic characters. Then he has his own delineation of what those characteristics are. Ironically, they all begin with the letter I, and they are not descriptions actually of mythic items. So there's a huge literature on ancient mythologies and how they have these motifs strung together. And some characters have all of them. Some of them have a few of them. But instead of doing his research with scholars who have studied mythology, he comes up with his own abstractions about these mythic characters, very few of which have actually to do with the structure of mythic narrative. So these are not narrative observations. They're really abstractions. And because he has that abstract understanding, he's able to take those categories and apply them universally to Jesus. So we'll see how that goes when he gives his taxonomy now. George Lucas very openly based his work upon the work of Joseph Campbell, whom I'm yep. sure you're familiar with. The, of the course. Would you say what Joseph Campbell was doing was a similar process of abstractizing the hero's journeys that he observed beforehand? Like, is that a similar process? No, it's a very similar process. You have Lord Ranklin, an English classicist who had, did something similar. And Joseph Campbell was interested in the monomyth to show that you have certain characteristics that are congenial to Carl Jung's understanding of the psyche and the organization of reality among humans from culture to culture. Other scholars say, folklorists have been more interested in the diversity of those images instead of the universality of them. So the Christian versions are interesting. They're very different from ancient Greek ones or Jewish ones or the Buddhist ones, Hindu ones, and so on. So, But to his credit, Joseph Campbell was able to identify these characteristics of mythology. Now, those characteristics of mythology are not at all what Wallace is presenting. He's presenting abstractions instead of narrative items and features of the mythic tale that George Lucas was interested in. Right. He very openly took Joseph Campbell's work and laid his stories on top of it very deliberately. But I think, in general, what Joseph Campbell's thesis was is that people are subconsciously doing this because this is how we've come to accept storytelling. Is that how you understand it? That's how Carl Jung talks about it. Folklorists would talk about it more in terms of social identity. And then I think it's my understanding of your thesis that the gospel writers, whoever they were, would have fallen somewhere in the spectrum between those two things. They weren't necessarily deliberately following the archetype, but they were obviously culturally so familiar with the archetype, but they couldn't help but tell it in that same way. Is that an accurate reflection of your hypothesis? No, I don't think it is, Paul. Actually. Oh, okay. They certainly were living in that environment, but the Homeric epics in particular had such power in defining Greek culture that alternative social groups found it necessary to engage with the Homeric epics in order to redefine for their readers their own identities. You see this most obviously in Virgil's Aeneid, where Virgil is rewriting the Iliad, the Odyssey, in order to give an founding narrative to the Roman Empire, and he did so beautifully. But Jews were doing that too, so they would imitate parts of the Odyssey in order to show that their god and their heroes were superior morally to what happens in the Homeric epics or Athenian tragedies. So it's really not just in the air, and they're not just borrowing because they're looking for good material. It's rather what the Greeks called syncrasis, 
comparison and often ethical comparison. Our hero is better than your hero. So for Jews, our Moses is better than your Odysseus. And so it's much more strategic. So it's moving away from the Carl Jung kind of universalists or Joseph Campbell's universalism here with a thousand faces to strategic literary syncrasis to compare the Homeric heroes, let's say, with uh, Jesus or Paul in order to show the superiority of the Christian movement. By the way, I'm convinced that Mark and Luke were conscious of competing with the imitations of Homer in Virgil. So in this case, you have competitive mimesis, competitive synchrosis. So not only is Jesus superior to the likes of Hector and Achilles or Odysseus, he's also superior to the likes of Virgil's Aeneas. And so the Christian movement has virtues that are superior to the virtues of the Roman Empire, or at least competitive. Would you also agree that they were also trying to say that Jesus was the better Moses and the better Joseph? Oh, absolutely. That's right. right. In fact, okay. that's happening already in the lost gospel. What causes humans to think about God and arrive at similar descriptions? I began to wonder if our common human interest in God resulted historically in common descriptions of God. Was Jesus just another in a long line of mythologies? Was Jesus a copycat savior? I began to read about the ancient deities and mythologies that dominated human history across the globe. After reading through their descriptions several times, I began to notice 15 characteristics commonly shared by these deities. Paul, his way of understanding myth is really much closer to what you find in Joseph Campbell than you find in my work, because he is really tone deaf to literary imitation and distinctions. You'll notice that he doesn't cite the historical evidence or the literary evidence for any of these heroes except in the Bible. So you have some Hebrew, some Jewish examples, and you find then Jesus. But there's nothing about Paul. But here is the biggest problem I have with this presentation. He doesn't talk about the Gospels, and he certainly doesn't talk about human authors. The Bible for him is the revelation from God. And the Gospels are there because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you would not get a sense that these authors of the Gospels made any contribution whatsoever to the creation of the mythology. So we know that these authors of the Gospels themselves were conscious of claiming the traditions of Judaism, right. also the Greeks, but of Judaism. So if you find similarities between Jesus and Moses, mm -hmm. it's because these authors want you to see that c comparison and to see that Jesus is better than Moses. If you see parallels, as he does, between Jesus and Joshua, it's because these authors wanted you to see that right. comparison, not yeah. because God wants you to see that comparison. If you see parallels between Jesus well, on a ship and Jonah, it's because gospel authors want you to see that and that Jesus is superior to Jonah. So it's right. an example of synchrosis. So, so this is really dehumanizing the gospel compositions by making them simply the result of the Holy Spirit inspiring relatively passive authors who are saying what God wants them to. And this is the part that I find to be so objectionable, Paul. That makes sense, yeah. Not only the, is he making doing that, but he is a supersessionist. Jesus is better than these other religions. And it's only in the Christian tradition where we have this myth becoming history. And one of the most tragic things that a literary character ever said, in my view, is C.S. Lewis's statement that, yes, you have this mythology, but in Jesus, the mythology became history. That's worse than supersessionism with Judaism. That's <laughs> making a claim for the Gospels that one should never claim for any human product. And it, 
privileges the Christian understanding. Now, right. as we go through this, see if they, he ever mentions the name of a gospel or a gospel author. If he ever cites a text, for him, it's, the text is the Bible. The Bible is a revelation. It is trustworthy. And so the historical claims it makes may have come, be similar to mythologies, but it's God who created those mythologies in order to make Jesus palatable and understandable. Now, what kind of cultural arrogance is that? It seems like his proposal is that God may well have seeded, he may have had a hand in creating these other religions or guiding precursor religions in order to somehow prime people toward Jesus, exactly. which is a weird... He, he says that, but the only examples he gives are from the Bible. Right. So well, uh, he doesn't say that God inspired Homer to create a, you know, a Zeus who's got a mythology that's satisfactory to what's going to happen to Jesus. So he's, he doesn't have the courage to go there. But that seems to be the inevitable conclusion. And let's see, maybe we'll see if no, we agree once we've right. heard it. No, yeah. I think you're right. First... In some ancient mythologies, the deity is inevitable, being foretold or predicted before his arrival. The birth of Persian god Zoroaster, for example, was allegedly foretold from the beginning of time. In many mythologies, the deity also comes from a royal or imperial heritage. Greek god Adonis, for instance, was the famed son of King Theus. More than a few deities were said to have been born by inexplicable supernatural means. Evangelicals love their alliteration, so good for him. In a few myths, the deity is insulated or protected as a child. I assume you're broadly willing to concede that he's reasonably accurate in these generalizations. Yes, I think that's right. And in fact, these alliterations do carry with them some narrative elements that would be similar to the heroic cycle that others have identified, including Joseph Campbell. Yeah. But something else stood out for me. These attributes were common not just to the ancient mythologies. They were also common to Jesus. In fact, while all the gods of antiquity shared some of the same expectations of deity, only Jesus personified and embodied every expectation. It seems to me that there could be some selection bias here on uh, Detective oh, Ball. You think so? You think so? Seems no, what he's done, it's, he's, he's taken these abstractions. He's understood them to be a part of a heroic cycle. And then he claims that these characteristics create expectations and the expectations then are satisfied in Jesus. You'll notice that there's no critical perspective on who Jesus is, on differences in the Gospels. I don't think there's a single Gospel that has all of these characteristics. So this is a homogenizing of the biblical Jesus in order to make it fit all these categories. It's a great point. Yeah, I have a lot of the harmonizing going on here. Yeah. I was reminded of back when we used to have magazines, printed magazines, you'd see the advertisements and there'd be your product versus the competing product. And for some reason, the person paying for the ad always had all the check marks and all the other products didn't have it. Well, of course, you're, you're arbitrarily picking categories that you excel in. So That's a good analogy, yeah. Why would Jesus just happen to personify the expectations of the ancients? Surely the gospel writers could not have known enough about the vast pantheon of gods to craft Jesus as pure fiction. The story of Jesus, even though it reflected the common expectations of people who had been thinking hard about God, was very different from the ancient myths. Is that a true dichotomy there, that either they had to be creating pure fiction or it was purely historical? No, I mean, the way people d dealt with Jesus, who was a historical person, is to make him more important by mythologizing it. And by the way, you can see now the optics have changed. It's in a church. You have a stained glass window with Jesus in the middle. And it's certainly not the historical Jesus. It's the glorified Christ, the Gospels. You'll also notice that he still hasn't talked about any of the Gospel authors. He hasn't talked about particular Gospels. He hasn't talked about texts. He assumes that the Jesus story is a monolith and that and it, it then bears these features. So I just think it's a hatchet job so far, Paul. C.S. Lewis once put it this way. 
The story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. There's that quote you didn't like from earlier. Right. Was Lewis right? Had God delivered in Jesus what the ancients had only imagined? If so, was there any evidence that God might have been preparing humanity for the arrival of Jesus? At least he acknowledges when he says, did God inspire the poets? Now, those poets are going to be Greek poets. They have probably, he has in mind, the Greek mythological poetry, including the Homeric epics and Athenian tragedy. Right. So that opens up the possibility of a more universal understanding of these mythic patterns, though he wants to say that God was the muse that Homer appealed to when he was writing his epics, and God was using the poet to write Protevangelium, a, a, an earlier gospel that had a foresight into the biblical Christ. So, but at least he's opened the door to the poets, and I appreciated that. Compare how the ancient pagans described their gods with this description from the Bible. Who am I describing? As a baby, he escaped the decree of a king and avoided certain death. He lived in Egypt as a child, but later returned to his homeland. He was known by his followers to be both humble and strong. He was tempted while in the wilderness. He was attested by God through signs and wonders. He worked a miracle at the sea. He fed thousands of people miraculously with bread. He spoke God's word and taught God's law from a mountain. He was the mediator between God and his people. Now, for those of you familiar with the stories of Jesus, this description seems to describe him perfectly. However, this historical figure preceded Jesus by thousands of years. This is the description of the prophet and leader, Moses. Here's another description from the Bible. He was the object of his father's love, was underestimated and dismissed by his family, fed the hungry, successfully resisted temptation, was falsely accused, was stripped of his robe and delivered to the Gentiles, was sold by someone he trusted for pieces of silver. Hmm. Although this sounds like Jesus, it's actually Joseph, nearly 400 years prior to Moses. He began his ministry in obscurity, but rose to a position of honor. He was anointed to lead and shepherd his followers. He did for God's children what his predecessor Moses could not do. He brought deliverance from the enemies of God and promised to give rest to his people. Sound familiar? It's Joshua. He was born in the town of Bethlehem, identified as a shepherd king. When he was young, he amazed his elders and he came from an unexpected pedigree. His popularity with the masses angered leaders but was nevertheless anointed by God to shepherd his people. That's King David. He preached repentance to the Gentiles and slept on a boat during a storm. He chose to sacrifice himself so that others might live and spent three days given up for dead. After those three days, he spent 40 days preaching. Although this last description also sounds like Jesus, it's the prophet Jonah. Now take a look at all of these descriptions in their totality. Who do they describe? This collective picture of Jesus is found not on the pages of the New Testament, but on the pages of the Old. The image of Jesus emerged over the centuries in the lives of leaders and prophets familiar to the Jewish community. He wants to say that you have those analogies because God is prepping the world for the coming of the, the Gospels, Jesus, without saying this. Of course, the authors of the Gospels are interested in making Jesus like a superior to Moses, to David, to Jonah, and so on. So I think this might be a good time to look at our slides. Sure. I want to compare Wallace's way of understanding these mythic items with how it works in mimesis, that is literary imitation in the Gospels. And we're going to start with the feeding stories. Okay. There are two miraculous feeding stories in the Gospel of Mark, and both of them have antecedents in the Odyssey, books three and four of the Odyssey. The first is the Feast of Nestor, and the other is the Feast of Menelaus. They are much closer to the feeding story in the Bible for the manna in the book of Exodus, which is the one that he's identifying with Moses. So, I'm going to read the left-hand column, and I'm going to ask you, Paul, to read the right-hand column, 
And we don't have to worry about the Greek words. If they become important, I'll identify those. And we'll ask at the end, which is more likely to be the model for the feeding of the 5,000? Is it Moses and manna, or is it the Odyssey? So I'll be reading from Odyssey books two and three. Wind filled the middle of the sail, and the purple waves flashed loudly at the cut water of the moving ship. And they departed privately in the boat to a desolate place. When they saw the strangers, that is, the people in Pelos, they all came in mass. They came to Pelos, and the people were at the shore of the seas offering sacrifices of black bulls. Many people saw them leaving, recognized them, by foot thronged there from all the cities, and got there before them. They disembarked. And when he disembarked... A very similar wording, by the way. Where Nestor is called shepherd of the people. He saw a large crowd and took pity on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Nestor is the Pimana ton loon, and Jesus is the Pimana. Same word is used in both texts. Dinner time arrived, and the disciples told Jesus that he should send the crowds home. On learning that the disciples had with them five loaves of bread and two dried fish, he told the disciples to seat the throng. In the Odyssey, Nestor fed 4,500 men. In Mark, Jesus feeds 5,000 men. So instead of 4,500 men, you have 5,000 men, men in both cases. So Jesus can feed more than Nestor can, but he does miraculously, whereas Nestor does it from his fat purse. There were nine groups, 500 men sat in each. When they saw the strangers, they all came in mass, welcomed them with a hand clasp, and seated them at the feast on soft fleeces over the sand of the sea. And he commanded them to have everyone recline on the green grass, drinking party by drinking party. And they reclined, garden bed by garden bed, by hundreds and fifties. So in one case, you have groups of 500, and the other have hundreds and fifties. So you hit, and it's on, you know, soft fleeces or soft grass. Mm. The two verbs that Mark uses to describe the crowd reclining imply that the meal was less a picnic than a banquet. Telemachus and Athena sat comfortably on soft fleeces over the sand. The crowd sat on green grass. Pisistratus offered hors d'oeuvres and said to Athena, who's actually mentor, O stranger, now pray to the Lord Poseidon. She did so. He took five of the loaves and two fish, looked up to the sky, praised God. And when they had roasted the outer meat and drawn it off, they divided the portions and distributed the glorious feast. Broke the bread into pieces and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and he divided the two fish for everyone. But when they had put from them the desire for food and drink, and everyone ate and was filled, and they took up twelve baskets, bulging with the scraps and chunks of the fish. Four thousand five hundred consisted exclusively of men, and the Greek word is andron. Those who ate the bread were five thousand men. Andres, same word. Whereas Nestor hosted an outdoor feast at the shore from his personal wealth, Jesus did so from his supernatural powers, evoking the powers, in this case, of Elisha in Second Kings. So here we have an author, not just the biblical Christ, who is using a model to portray Jesus as the giver of a feast and to show that he is superior not to Moses, he's superior to Nestor. Now, you can say that there are elements here that evoke the giving of manna. I suppose you can. But just as the Odyssey has two feeding stories, so does Mark. Mark also has the feeding of the 4,000. So if you look at slide two, Paul, we can see that this business continues for Mark. Sounds good. Jesus miraculously provides a feast for an enormous crowd again. In Odyssey 4, Menelaus had provided the meal from his fabled wealth. Compare the following. So this is Odyssey 4. They sat on high back chairs next to Atreides Menelaus. The honored housekeeper brought bread to distribute, and they set them before them. He ordered the crowd to recline on the ground. After taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, 
broke them, and gave the pieces to his disciples to set it before the crowd. Take a look, Paul. The words in the two texts are almost identical for setting it before them. The carver set up and set before them, same verb, platters of fish of all kinds, so they applied their hands to the refreshments. And they had a few small fish. After blessing them, he said that these two should be given out. Then when they had put from them the desire for food and drink and so on. And they ate and were filled. And now those parallels are not accidental. Sorry, Joseph Campbell, this is not <laughs> simply universal mythologizing. It's strategic mimesis. And it, uh, Virgil imitates the feast of Nestor in the Aeneid when Evander welcomes the, the Trojan army to a feast among his Etruscans. So th this is in the air. Now, I want to say very briefly what the seven criteria of mimesis criticism are. The first is the availability of the targeted model. And of course, the Odyssey was better known than the Septuagint in antiquity. There's no doubt about it. What about an analogous imitation? That's criterion two. We know that Virgil imitates this passage, and other authors do as well. What about the density, order, and distinctiveness of these parallels? And I think you'd have to agree, in this case, they're pretty striking. Then, criterion six is interpretability. Why would an author do it? Ah, uh, well, it's the synchrosis. It's to show that Jesus is superior to Nestor. And what about evidence that these passages were understood in antiquity as being from Homer? When Byzantine intellectuals went to rewrite some gospel stories, they used the same lines from the Odyssey that inspired them originally. So when I'm talking about mimesis, I'm not inventing something that is not a part of the interpretive tradition of the Christian church. It's a part of that tradition. Now, it's also clear that people understood what Jesus is doing in feeding the thousands is similar to Moses feeding people with manna. So there is that tradition as well. But I would insist that it's not an either-or. It could be eclectic or a hybridic mimesis where you have images that come from Jewish scriptures, but you also have them coming from poetry. Now, Wallace could make a case that it just shows that God is inspiring Homer to <laughs> ahead of time. But then you have to say, but it is Mark, not the Holy Spirit, who is interested in this comparison. And he does so in order to show that Jesus is superior to a Nestor and actually to a Vander and Aeneas. Okay. Well, let's take another example. Wallace makes a, a statement about stilling the storm and surviving the Jonah story. Right. I'm going to give you a comparison of Jesus sleeping on the boat and waking and, and calming the storms. And this is another example of Mark imitating the Homeric epic. Okay. Here are the parallels between Odyssey 10 and Mark 4. Odysseus told Alcinous on a floating island tales of the Trojan War. Jesus taught the crowds while floating on a boat. For nine days, night and day alike. On that day, when it was late, he says to them, Let's pass over to the other side. They left the crowd and took him. He was already in the boat. Odysseus had 13 ships. We sailed, and already on the 10th our homeland appeared. Then sweet sleep came over me. Other boats were with him. Jesus here is in a flotilla. This is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus is not just in a boat, but he's traveling with the flotilla. When Matthew and Luke rewrite this story, they remove the other boats because they're entirely superfluous to the story, but not to the mimesis. And what's right? a flotilla? A, a convoy oh, okay. of ships, you know, okay. other ships. Okay. Odysseus's crew untied the bag of winds, and all the winds rushed out. The gale immediately snatched them and drove them out to sea. And a great gale of wind came up, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it already was filling. He himself was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. By their our own folly, we were perishing. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you see the similarities in Greek, Paul? I do. 
but I rose up again similar in Mark and pondered in my blameless heart whether to jump from the ship and perish in the sea or calmly to endure and remain still among the living. He rose up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind died down, and there was a great calm. Odysseus could not calm the winds, but Aeolus, the god of the winds, could. And he said to them, Why were you such cowards? Do you still have no faith? They were greatly afraid, and were saying to each other, What kind of person is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And the answer to that rhetorical question is, he is not like Odysseus, mm. who couldn't calm the sea. He's more like the god Aeolus, who can calm the wind and the sea. So that Jesus is superior to Odysseus. So again, is the Odyssey available to the authors? Right. And we know that there are analogies to this story in literature. The parallels are dense, sequential, and distinctive, including common vocabulary at strategic points. Wow. It's interpretable because you can say that Jesus is superior to Odysseus, but like the god Aeolus. And there is one short passage among the Byzantine authors that suggests they saw the similarities between these stories. Now, is it more likely that behind this story is the story of Jonah, or is it the story of Odysseus? And my answer to that, before you answer, is it's both, because we have vocabulary also that is similar to Jonah. And I think the author saw similarities between the shipwreck story of Jonah and the shipwreck story of Odysseus and his men, and created a mimetic hybrid in order to say that Jesus is superior to both. And it doesn't need to be one or the other. But in the way that Wallace treats it, it's the mytheme comes from a Jonah, but it doesn't come from Odysseus. But the bigger point to be made is, Paul, that we have now talked about the image of Jesus being a human creative production and not simply what God has put on the earth as the culmination of, you know, cultural factors that informed the early church. So now we can see how these authors are working, in this case, the Gospel of Mark. And I can give you another example later that has absolutely no parallel in the Hebrew Bible, except one little phrase. But it clearly is imitating the death of Hector at the end of the Iliad. So we've been talking about the Odyssey, but this example will be the end. Now, in my book, Synopses of Epic Tragedy and the Gospels, and in the course called Reading the Gospels with One Eye on Greek Poetry, you find many examples of this phenomenon. In fact, you find scores of them. So we're not talking about a one-off. We're talking about the shape of the New Testament narratives being profoundly informed by Greek poetry, if largely in rivalry with the Aeneid. And if that's right, Christians, including Wallace, are going to have to do some recalibration of their theology to account for human creativity, and that these stories are there to create mythologies for social identities of emerging Christian groups that are competing with the Bible, but they're also competing with Greek religion. And instead of seeing a kind of continuity between ancient mythologies and Jesus, I think we need to understand them to be somewhat competitive and consciously competitive, that Jesus is not just like them, he's superior to them. And I think Wallace has just bought into the notion that Jesus, in fact, historically was superior to all of these other characters, because God had been prepping earlier authors, including the poets and biblical authors, to create mythologies that would lead up to Jesus. So he's on the path to your conclusion. He just needs to take a couple more steps. Is that fair? <laughs> well, yeah, I think he's got to take a big step. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's finish this out. Jesus possessed all 15 divine expectations of non-Jewish cultures. He also personified all the attributes of Israel's ancient leaders. 
If God truly exists and he wanted to make himself known in a way that would be recognized by humans across the globe, it seemed reasonable that he would meet the expectations of the humans he created. Jesus seemed to meet those expectations robustly. Was Jesus the true myth that Lewis had described? Was God expressing himself through what we call real things? Was Jesus the divine person of interest the pastor had described? He worked the name of his own book into that. I just noticed that and how it made me laugh. Good job, Jake. Was the fuse leading up to the common era uniquely preparing history for the coming of Jesus Christ? And one of his coming had been predicted all along. Well, Paul, there's no critical perspective there whatsoever. He still and never talked about the Gospels. He talked about Jesus. He never talked about human production and why Jesus was important to various authors. He never talked about the early Christian communities that cherished but differed in their understandings of Jesus. So I don't know if he's just not educated in biblical scholarship, but certainly serious biblical scholars, and not just, not just me, would consider that to be really worse than unprofessional, but really quite ignorant. Wow. Well, if you want to avoid being as ignorant as Detective Wallace, Dr. MacDonald has recently put out his course, Reading the Gospels with One Eye on Greek Poetry, over on MVP Courses. So it's beautifully shot, excellent sound, lots of visual interest, but most importantly, fantastic information. I've been going through it and I'm learning so much. We wanted to put something together that would be easier for people to digest than the 564 pages of that tome, which really is a reference work. And it is mm -hmm. not easy sledding. It's not easy to get to. And to cherry pick some of the stories, just as we have done, to read back and forth to get a sense of how early Christian authors were engaging with Greek poetry. So there's an introductory lecture on mimesis criticism, its criteria, and it's an analogies in the ancient world, a little introduction to the Homeric epics and so on. And after that, there are 17 relatively short spots going from about 20 minutes to about 40 minutes in which we do just what we've been doing, Paul, reading the parallels and then talking about them and why authors would put them together in this way. We wrap it up in the final session with a reading like this and then some more comments. We only touched, oh, probably 20 different stories out of really scores that are here. The Acts of the Apostles, the Gospel of John, we haven't talked about them, but they're full of these parallels too. It's it feels like a cold bath to some people when they first see it, especially if they've been warmed by evangelical or Catholic theology. But it really will warm your heart once you see it put out that way. At least that's my hope. So in Detective Wallace's parlance, you've got quite a cumulative case going here. Oh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. You can sign up for reading the Gospels with one eye on Greek poetry today. And if you use the link tinyurl.com slash greekmcdonald, you'll be helping this channel and its mission. And as always, we greatly appreciate that. Again, tinyurl.com slash greekmcdonald, or check the description of the video. Obviously, I'm not taken with Wallace and his understanding of early Christianity, but I'm a big fan of early Christianity and its wisdom. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of their religion. I'm trying to talk them out of their ignorance. And Wallace is an example of that ignorance. So it is possible, surely, for one to identify with different mythologies and to own them as mythologies, but as wisdom for one's own life. And I would hope that people could see what these early Christians are doing positively. It's not that they're stealing from Greeks or from Jewish scriptures. They're culturally transforming them because they have a different ethic and a different identity that they want to promote. And Jesus is the vehicle for that alternative vision. So even though I'm an atheist, I accept these stories with great respect and have been nourished by them. But it's a choice that I make that their wisdom is worth taking seriously.
Now, that doesn't mean I don't take the Greek wisdom seriously. It doesn't mean I don't take Jewish wisdom seriously. And I wish I knew more about the wisdom of other religious groups. My work is not intended to be anti-religious. It's anti-stupidity. And so I think we're all going to be better off if our religions are more thoughtful and more humble and more inclusive. Well, I'm all for anti-stupidity in any form. And if you'd like to see more of this former Christian taking a look at the claims of Christians, tap the link on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later.